evening. Uh, it is great to be here with you in New Bremen. Uh, my name is Bill Babion, and I have the pleasure of hosting this evening and being one of the coordinators of uh, Momentum Ohio. And we're excited to be here in this community and glad that on this rainy, very rainy, I guess that's not very unusual, is it? Uh, this very rainy evening you chose, chose to join us. Now, let me just say a word about Momentum Ohio. Uh, how many of you know that in sports, momentum is a very big deal? You know that? Momentum is this kind of mysterious thing, isn't it? You know, how a game could be going along and one team could be dominating a game or winning a game clearly, and then something changes. Something happens, and all of a sudden the tides turn, it's moving the other direction, and what seemed to be this insurmountable lead begins to dwindle and uh, the game is up for grabs. And Momentum Ohio, our desire is to be a part of Momentum for good. Uh, we desire to be a part of what we think God wants to do in the state of Ohio and together with Aaron Craft, Dallas Lauderdale and many other partners, we want to, to see change. And so we want to be a part of that momentum and I hope that tonight you'll be encouraged by the things that you hear. Uh, what we're gonna do tonight really is we're gonna have a chance to hear personally from, from Aaron and from Dallas uh, and their journey as Buckeyes. Any, any Ohio State fans in the house tonight? Where are they? Come on, there we go, yeah. So, especially that little guy right there. <laughs> That's awesome, being raised well, it's good to see. It's good to see. Well. We are excited to have them here, and uh, I know that they're really looking forward and, uh, to the opportunity to share tonight about their lives as Buckeyes, but also as men who have sought to, to follow God in their life, and God has had a big impact on who they are and who they've become and where they're going in their lives at this point. Uh, so we're excited to hear more about that story, and, and I'm glad that you chose to, to come and hear more about that. Uh, to this day, today, we had a great time playing basketball. How many, uh, how many of you out here were a part of the basketball clinics today? Yeah, pretty good number. Thanks for coming out again, and thanks parents and grandparents for helping them to get there. We had a great time playing basketball today. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I want to say a special word of thanks to everyone in the athletic department, Gary Jones, uh, and the coaches, Chris, Corey, John, for, for being there with us, with us today, Chad as well, uh, for really hosting us and giving us the opportunity to be a part of, of this basketball community. So this has also been sponsored as an event, Momentum Ohio, together with uh, Faith Alliance Church, and very glad that Pastor Trent Flutter John is here tonight. He's going to help host this evening. So I want to give Trent a, a moment to introduce himself and his church. Test, good deal. All right, yeah, my name is Trent Flutterjohn. I uh, work with Faith Lions Church here in New Bremen. Uh, excited to have these guys here with us today. Um, sports fan myself, uh, Ohio State fan specifically, so uh, that makes it a little extra special. Uh, Faith Alliance, we talk a lot about discipleship. That's, uh, you know, growing people up towards a specific end, and uh, we do a lot of discipleship with sports. Uh, you know, as already mentioned, there's a, a little guy with his Ohio State clothing. Uh, so we're doing great discipleship in the area of Ohio State athletics. Uh, my hope is that tonight, you know, we get to talk about some spiritual things and uh, specifically discipling people towards Christ. I uh, believe that's the most important relationship that a person can have uh, in my own life experience that. And uh, so, you know, that's obviously uh, my heart and excitement for this evening is just to hear the heart of, of Aaron and Dallas uh, in some specific ways and hope and pray that uh, if anybody here is longing for anything that they have, that it'd be an opportunity uh, just to embrace that in your own life. Uh, so not only hear from them as athletes, but as human beings uh, created in God's image with uh, special things. So, uh, but yeah, happy to be here. Looking forward to the time we have together. Uh, grateful that you all took the time out of your night to show up. And uh, so thanks for being here. Very good. All right. Well, we, uh, 
we're going to hear from Aaron and Dallas in just a minute here. Uh, just to tell you where we're going, we're going to interact with them. And at the end of the evening, we're going to give you a card as well that will provide some opportunities for you to give uh, feedback on things that you might be interested in knowing about in the future. They will also be used for drawing a few prizes. We're gonna, we've got some t-shirts we're going to give away. Uh, so just so you know that that's going to happen later on this evening. Um, let me start by introducing Dallas. Um, Honestly, I know that in this part of the state, Dallas might be less known than Aaron. Is that true, Dallas? Do you think is that a safe thing to say? And uh, to no fault of his own, Dallas is an amazing guy. Dallas is from Solon, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. He, uh, as a high school player, was an all-state player. He was also on an AAU national championship team in high school. He played at Ohio State from 2007 to 2011. He was first team all Big Ten defense, uh, and he is third actually in the history of Ohio State basketball in blocks. So he collected a bunch of them on those kids running around out there today too. I think that total is growing every day. Uh, he has played professionally for multiple uh, G League teams uh, here in the U.S. Uh, most recently this year has been playing for the Maine Red Claws, which is the uh, development team for the Boston Celtics. He's also played internationally in Poland and Hungary. In fact, Dallas and I met for the first time in Hungary uh, just a little, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Dallas personally also has a master's in Christian leadership from Moody Bible Institute and is the founder of the Direction Up Foundation in his community, trying to help uh, kids in his community in areas of need in their lives. Uh, very excited to have Aaron here tonight. Aaron uh, went to Liberty Benton High School in Finley, Ohio. He was, uh, his junior year, the Division V Football Player of the Year, and then uh, later became the Division III Basketball Player of the Year as a senior. He played at Ohio State from 2010 to 2014. He was two-time Defensive Player of the Year for the Big Ten. Uh, he was the National Defensive Player of the Year for the NCAA his senior year, and he was also a three-time Academic All-American. Not bad. Uh, professionally, he's been playing, he played in the Development League uh, for the Golden State Warriors team. He's played in France, in Italy, and in Hungary, in Monaco, Montenegro. Uh, he's now be become the Defensive Player of the, War uh, of the Year in both France and in Italy the last two years. And so uh, he's, he's done pretty well. He's married to his uh, high school sweetheart, he can tell you more about that, Amber, and they just had their first child, Owen, uh, about four and a half months ago, and so their lives are very different now than they were four months ago. All right, Aaron, Dallas, come on up. Uh, see if we can get you set up on these mics here now. I think you'd be good there. There you go. All right. Well, nice. welcome, guys. Don't let me forget this when I leave. All of you are witnesses. Don't let me forget this behind you. Thank you. There's a little red button. I don't want there. Dallas to talk. It's okay. Hey, why don't you uh, update us? Where are you now? What are you doing? I know you just did an interview about that. Where are you now? What's life look for you? Look like for you since your Ohio State days? Yeah. Uh, that's a long time ago. That was five years ago now. But um, life now is, is great. Uh, like you said, uh, I'm married to Amber. We've been together a long time. We've been married four years, coming up on um, five in August. We just had our, um, a son named Owen four and a half months ago. And he has changed our lives for sure. Um, but it's been great. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. We recently bought a house down um, south of Columbus uh, to kind of give us our own space and some stability. And I recently just signed to go back and play one more year in uh, Italy. So that's kind of where I am right now. And Very good. Dallas, how about you? So what did he say? He said he's married, he has a kid, and he just signed somewhere. That was his update. Okay, my update is I'm single, I have no kids, and I'm still unemployed. <laughs> So we can just rock with that. No, but uh, happy to be back in Columbus. Happy to be back home. Um, last play in the NBA G League. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a free bird. I have a lot of free time, a lot of time to 
Um, to watch Owen? Yeah, to watch Owen. Okay. <laughs> Call. So where did the, the two of you meet? When did the two of you meet? The, the relationship you guys have, when did that all start? It was my senior year in Kraft's freshman year. So Kraft came in as a, in as a freshman when I was a senior um, on that 2011 team when um, it didn't end the way it should have ended, um, but had great success that season. A lot of fun that season, but we had one year together and we've been going strong ever since. Great. And uh, give us a little insight. What's it like playing for Ohio State, a, a big name program, high competition, high expectation, a lot of eyes on you? Uh, what's that like? Uh, wow. Uh, it's tough to describe. Uh, I mean, both of us growing up in Ohio, I think it also added a little special flair to it. Um, like I was saying earlier, Ohio State is like the professional team almost if you in Ohio, that's the team you root for. So to be able to represent them in such a visible light, in such a visible stage is, is, is awesome. And you don't appreciate that while you're in there, like while you're at school, you, you, think, you're, you think you're really good. You think you're a, like, you know, pretty hot stuff, but um, for some reason they believed in us. And uh, it, was, it was a ton of fun to be able to play against some of the best players in the country. Um, you know, night in and night out. The Big Ten when we were in school was for sure the best conference in the country. So, was there a, did, did they agree with that? I don't know. I heard some smirks. I, I, I don't heard know some smirks. Y'all are, y'all are I crazy. Don't I don't know what's going on. <laughs> y'all are crazy. I heard some smirks. It's, it's been a while, so we're just trying to. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a while ago, but it, we were, <laughs> it was tough. Um, so yeah, that, oh, I mean, it was, it was just a great time. and. For me, like he said, you know, I came as a freshman not really knowing what to do, and him and uh, that senior class was unbelievable for me. Uh, they just really set the tone for what college athletics is, is supposed to be about. Um, they love to practice. They love to be in practice and, and have a good time, and, and that was great for me to see as a young player, um, and you know, they had a lot of fun. It wasn't they got serious when they needed to, but they had a ton of fun. I got I, I wrestled a lot with David Lighty, like legit wrestled and he beat me every time but uh, it was just it was it really was like a family and that's really what we are and like we, we stay in touch even now in the summer we're all together in in Columbus hanging out playing basketball talking going over each other's houses um, so it really created a bond that, that we'll have for the rest of our life so uh, how about highlights lowlights what were uh, some some of the high points that you remember from your time at Ohio State and maybe a, a tough time that you faced? I think for me, um, the highest of lights probably did not come on the court. I think everything that we did off the court is what made us such a special group. I mean, you think I have video footage of, of us being on the bus ride singing My Girl and, and singing old temptation songs and playing practical jokes on each other and just, just, just being college kids. And I think that the, the bond that we had off the court is what allowed us to have so much success on the court. Um, I think the, the low light for me would be my senior year when that buzzer shot against Kentucky. That, I think that was one of the, the toughest times that um, I've been through as a basketball player, just just knowing that we should have we sh we should have done better that year. Um, so, it's tough and quick. It always ends quick. Right, it's like it's over. Um, yeah, you know, losing the NCAA tournament was is always super tough, um, especially because a lot of them are really close. Uh, it comes down to one possession, last pos uh, you know the last one, and all of a sudden you know you all this fun you've had with all these guys just in a moment is over. And then it hits you that it's over. And uh, you realize, I'm never going to get to play with these guys again. And so it was just, it's a quick snapshot of, you know, not taking anything for granted. Um, another tough time for me was, you know, my senior year, we, we started off great. We were 15 to 0, ranked in the top five in the country, I believe. And um, January hit, and we didn't, we didn't win a game in January. We lost like five in a row, which I had never done in my life. Um, so I'm really searching. I have, it's my senior year. Like, it's supposed to, you know, end on a high note. You know, what are we doing? 
Um, so there was a lot of question marks you know, flying around at that point, and we still, you know, we fluttered into the NCAA tournament, and that was when we ended up losing to Dayton, you know, in the first round at the buzzer. So, um, you know, career's over, um, not really how I was hoping. Um, so that was, that was tough, and like Dallas said, you know, the basketball's been great. I, I got to play in a lot of big games. I got to play in the Final Four, um, up three with two minutes to go, and we lost. Um, <laughs> Every time I see that highlight, I hate it because they call a timeout. We're up three with 2.20 to go. And it's like, how do we not win the game? Um, but, you know, th that stuff's great. You know, Final Four was awesome. That's why you go play college basketball is to play in the Final Four. Uh, that was awesome, playing in front of 70,000 people. Um, but like, like he said, you know, my favorite memory about the Final Four has nothing to do with the game or the fans. Uh, in the Final Four, you go down a week, like, four or five days before the game because you have to do like media responsibilities and you get to practice on the floor and all this stuff. So one of the days we were there doing media, we were kind of sitting in the locker room being bored and one of the guys, um, the, the, uh, the underclass were like let's, like, let's do something. So we took a foam roll, which um, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like a, a long foam, um, it's a long foam roll. Um, <laughs> it's like a long, don't get technical with it's us. a long cylinder made of foam that you roll on for your legs. But it, it kind of looks like a bat. And then we made a ball out of tape, and we were playing baseball in our locker room, like running in the locker room, hitting it, literally playing baseball in this football stadium. And no one else knows about that. But like, it was times like that, that that are the most fun to look back and think about. We were playing, we were a basketball team playing baseball in a football locker room. You know, like, no one knows about that, but just stuff like that is awesome. That's cool. Did you play Mario Kart? Uh, definitely. There was, there was a lot of Mario Kart that happened. Um, Mario Kart was serious. Double Dash. We got, we got double some, Dash. We almost got into some real fist fights over Mario Kart. <laughs> it was intense. Who, who's your uh, person there on Mario Kart? Do you have a standard? Oh, Yoshi. All day. Oh, it's Yoshi. Okay. Good to know. Well, uh, what was... Uh, we, we, we would love to hear more, you know, on your journey in terms of your relationship with God. Uh, I, knowing you guys, I know that you, you come from pretty different backgrounds and in different regards, but spiritually, in terms of kind of where you came from and what that looked like for you, you're, you're at a common place now in your life, but you definitely didn't start there. So mm -hmm. talk to us about that. What was it like kind of when you think about faith and God and relationship with him? Tell us about your journey and where did it start? What's that look like? Yeah, um, I'll go first. Beauty before age. <laughs> I guess. Um, so, yeah, just I, I did not grow up going to church. Um, I was telling some people earlier, if you have asked me when I was in seventh or eighth grade uh, how many thoughts I'd had about God or, like, asked me who God was, I couldn't have given you an answer. Um, I wouldn't. I honestly have no clue what I would have said. I probably would have made something up to try to sound smart, um, but it would have been completely false because I, didn't, I never thought about God. I, I, there, was no, there was no reason to think about him in my life. I thought life was going well. And uh, by the time I got to high school, like you said, I went to Liberty Bend, which is a smaller school similar to New Bremen. So freshmen are able to play you know, pretty early on in their careers, and I was able to do that. Um, and we had a lot of success, won a lot of games. And as I got older, I started, continued to play, but I started getting recognized personally for individual awards and loved it. You know, it was, it was all I was hoping for and dreaming for um, as an athlete kind of going into high school. But when, when I, after my junior year, we had just, um, we had just lost in the state championship in football. And, um, you know, I was really contemplating, you know, what, like, why, is, why are these sports not giving me all the joy, like the satisfaction that I was hoping for? Um, I, I never won a state championship, but I think in my mind, I thought if I win one of those, that's it. That'll, that'll get me over the hump and I'll, basketball sports will kind of answer all my questions. But um, going into my senior year, I knew I was gonna play basketball in college. So I really started thinking about, you know, what, role sports played in my life. If, if these sports in high school weren't giving me, you know, the joy that I was hoping for, um, why would college basketball be any different? So that worried me that I was going to chase down this path of, you know, 
I enjoyed it, but it didn't really, it wasn't the fullness that I was expecting. So that's when I had a friend invite me to a Bible study that I dodged for a good two, three weeks. Um, but he, you know, thankfully he kept asking me to come. So he got me into there, and at the time I was dating my wife, um, and she started inviting me to go to church. And I dodged her even longer because her church started at 8 a.m., and that just wasn't, that wasn't, my, that wasn't my role. You know, that wasn't my speed. Uh, but, you know, some, for some reason I ended up going, and the message was, was pretty clear. You know, they both, both places were talking about a guy named Jesus that um, somehow cared about me and, and loved me and uh, just... They both, I had, I had mentors in my life that were telling me, you know, what I'm chasing is not another award. It's not a state championship. It's not, um, it's not another point. It's not another A on a test, but it's in a person. Um, that's what I was missing. I was missing a person. I was missing a relationship to fill that void and fill what I was, felt like sports were supposed to um, satisfy me with. So that's kind of how I projected up towards it. And by the time I got to college, I... Um, we had a teammate, John Diebler, on that, that freshman year, and he was a senior. So when I got there, I told myself, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do what he does because he's a senior at Ohio State. He's figured it out. And honestly, I... And you had known John from I, Yeah, earlier. I knew John. That's why I had known John since I was in sixth grade. So I, I honestly, I told myself, whatever he does, I'm going to do. Uh, and I swear, if he, if he would have gone out every Thursday night, I would have gone out every Thursday night if... Whatever he was going to do, I was going to follow. I spent more time with him that year than I did with my girlfriend, um, which I don't know why she stayed with me. Um, played a lot of video games. But we moved to campus on a Sunday. And that next Monday, the very next day, the first thing he invites me to is a Bible study right outside of my dorm. And like I said, I'm going to follow whatever you do. So I followed him, and that's what I did. And he kind of set me on this path of, showing me what it was like to, to be a believer, but also, you know, an athlete and what, what all that tied into. So. Yeah, I'd love to come back and even revisit the question of just kind of the role that your relationship with each other has had in terms of helping you mm -hmm. grow in your faith. But Dallas, why don't you give us a little context for you and your journey? Um, for me, my journey was a little bit different. Um, my great-grandfather, grandfather, and father are all preachers, so I grew up in the church. I grew up um, in church every Sunday morning. I was in Bible study every Wednesday night. I was at vacation Bible school and Sunday school and all that. I was there. Um, and so I grew up learning and knowing how to play the game, how, how to, how, I, I knew how to respond to uh, questions that came. I knew what to wear to, to make it look like I was a Christian or that I, 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 I was a church attender. I, I played the game. And so it, it did not become real to me until December of 2012 when I realized that my entire life was a lie. Uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. My lifestyle was not consistent with what the Word of God said. I realized that I had not surrendered every single aspect, every single part of my life, and I was just playing the game. And I realized that the game of eternity is not a game that you want to play. Um, the, the game of where you're going to spend eternity is not a game you want to play. And, and, and I'm so grateful that God sort of, he, he got me to rock bottom. He got me to a place where I, I wasn't happy with where I was professionally. I wasn't happy to where, where I was financially. I, I wasn't happy where I was in relationships. I was, just, I was just at rock bottom. But what he showed me was that he was the rock at the bottom. He, he was the rock that, that I was able to fall on at the bottom. And I just, at that point in December 2012, that's when I surrendered everything to him. And ever since then, my, my life has has been totally different. Um, I'm, it's, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to fake it. It's way harder to fake a relationship with God than it is to just have one and just be genuine and be authentic and be real about what it is. It's, it's, it's hard to think about, okay, what did I say to her last week? Did I say I was cool or did I say I was struggling? What did I say to him? You have to try and remember the lie. And that's what made it so difficult. And so um, it's, it's, it's a much freer life 
um, to just be real about your relationship. So that is just um, sort of my journey. Yeah. So what about, uh, you know, you put your faith in Christ, but you guys are following after him, but, but what leads you here? I mean, from my understanding, Aaron's got a, a four-month-old at home, uh, just, just uh, moved into a new place, uh, not a lot of incentive for you guys to be here. What, why? Why you come out and do something like this? It matters. And I think that this, this is the one thing that we're doing right now, that we're up here trying to, to tell the audience, to tell the world about a man named Jesus Christ who, who came and died for our sins. This is the one thing that we won't be able to do in heaven. I think this is the one thing that, this is the one reason why God has not taken us home. Because there are some people, even in this, I would be, I wouldn't be wise to think that every single person in this, in this audience was saved. And so if, even if it's one, it matters. And so that is our job. You know, basketball is just the, the, the method that we use it. That's the tool. That's the route that God allows us to use to really get to the more important message, which, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, that's why we're here. If, if we're not doing that, then what are we really here for? Yeah, the uh, love to step back into your journey in, in thinking about kind of how you got from there to here, you know, in terms of your growth. What tell us describe the difference of life with God versus life without God? I mean, where how do you see the reality of God uh, in your life? What change has that meant? What was it really? What's it really look like? Yeah, um, I think for me, like Coach Mata would always say it all the time. Uh, like when we were in, in college um, playing basketball, it was like, you know, never get too high, never get too low. You want to stay as even as possible during a game because if you get too high, you end up making mistakes. If you get too low and you're thinking too bad, you're going to make mistakes. So what you want to do is you want to be the team that plays the most consistent throughout the game, and that's usually the one that's going to be successful in the end. And I think that God is what allows my life, not, not, not basketball, allows my life to stay at that consistent, that consistent line. Because without him, like in high school for sure, in college definitely, um, still so now, when I play well and our team does well, like I feel good. Like I, I naturally feel, it, I feel a high. But it also swings the other way. When our team loses or I struggle and I miss all my shots or whatever, I, I swing to the other end. And one, that's not fair to my wife. You know, she's, she's a bigger priority to, to me than any basketball game that I play. It's not fair to my son. And when I go home and I'm droop, you know, I'm dreary and just feeling sorry for myself, he doesn't care. He just wants to look at me and, you know, he wants me to make a silly face and for him to smile at me right now. And, um, God is, is what allows, that eliminates, or he doesn't eliminate because it's, I'm still broken, I still make mistakes, I still fluctuate. But he just, he decreases the amplitude uh, of those highs and lows um, because he's who gives me purpose, he's, he's who gives me the reason to live, you know. Like as Dallas said, this is, this, what we're doing, what we're talking about, is way bigger and way more important than any game that I could ever win or play in. And, you know, like you said, you know, I have a four-month-old at home that is not the easiest to get to go to sleep. Um, so maybe that's why I'm here. I'm avoiding that. Um, well done. But, uh, but no, you know, I would, I would love to be at home helping my wife. She's, she's been by herself all day today. But like Dallas said, this, like, this is even more important than my family. Like what, what we're talking about exceeds all other things in, in our life. So if we can give our, our time to that, that's, that's what we have to do. And that's kind of how God has you know, taught me about life. You know, he, he needs to be number one. He needs to be what I talk about and what, who I represent at all times. Um, you never know who's watching and you never know who you can impact. So he's who gives me that steady line to, to live on and um, to follow and trust in and because he's not gonna change. He's not gonna wake up tomorrow and you know, give me the cold shoulder and um, leave me out to dry. He, I can wake up every day knowing that he's going to be there and I can, I can have fellowship with him. So that's, yeah. 
Yeah. Not my short answer, I guess. Yeah. And, and even adding on to that, I think we live in a world, actually, I know we live in a world where suicide rates are at an all-time high and depression and anxiety attacks and people just not being satisfied with where they are in life. And I think what Crafty, you just hit on was, was, was just knowing that you, you can hope and you can have faith in a savior. You can have faith in God. And what that, the things that come with that are the promises that are in his book. And so his book is the Bible. And so one of my life verses that has sort of, since 2000, has 2012, that has sort of kept me moving is Romans 8.28, which says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's a promise to us. As a child of God, it says that all things work together for our good. So that means every single thing that we're going through, that we will go through, that we have gone through, somehow, some way, God is going to work it together for our good. And that, that verse right there is a verse that can, that can sustain you throughout life. If you just, if you take that promise, if you trust in it, if you have faith in it, and if you apply it to every situation in your life, I think that's a verse that can sustain you. It, it, it really doesn't matter what it is you're going through. And, and even if you can't see the good in the situation at this time, maybe a year from now or two years from now or five years from now, you'll, able, you'll be able to look back and be like, wow, I remember in June 2019, I was going through that. I didn't understand why I was going through that until now. It was 2024. But I understand that if God had not brought me through that, I would not have faith and believe that he can bring me through whatever it is I'm going through now. So it's just... It's, it's just one of those things that it, it's a benefit of, of, of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'd be interested in hearing a, a little bit about, um, I guess you might call it breakthrough or, or you've referenced the idea of surrender. You know, both of you uh, grew up in an environment, Aaron, where you weren't really even a believer, you know, growing up through high school, Dallas, you were kind of playing the game and, and there had to have been a point where you kind of took on an identity shift from old Aaron to new Aaron and, you know, from Dallas, it was playing the game to committed follower. And I think a lot of times, especially in small areas, there's kind of an identity that comes with a person. And it's really hard to break through that, you know, with our friends or, you know, even a, even a spouse maybe. So, so what would you say to people that maybe they desire those a deeper place spiritually, but are just hesitant because of, you know, that, that sense of identity that they've carried for so long? Wow. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, unlike, I mean, I have a, a faith story and um, I explained it to you recently, you know, briefly. And unlike Dallas, you know, mine didn't come in one, like one day or like, you know, one night in a hotel room. I don't have a date. Mine was honestly like a slow progression. Um, and it, it didn't, I, mean, I wasn't living this crazy radical life before. Um, I was living the life that I thought everyone thought I should. I was going to school and getting good grades and trying to make as many friends as possible. And, um, you know, I just think the motivation behind those things changed for me. Um, like my actions didn't necessarily change. What, what I was doing um, didn't radically shift. Like I, I, I don't really drink, like I didn't drink. I, I, I don't, like I didn't do drugs. Like I, none of that stuff was think, were things I had to really like throw off. And, but it was just the, the heart behind everything I was doing is what shifted. Um, it went from everything focusing on me and like how do I position myself for all these people to like me or how do I position myself to, to be as successful as possible to um, hey like this is this is a lot of fun this is a beautiful gift like I, this doesn't have to be who I am like bas a basketball player um, doesn't have to be what everyone thinks about when they think of Aaron Kraft um, it, I, he doesn't just have to be the guy that's good at school or has a lot of friends like I I had a, a new, I just had a new purpose in life, you know, and, and like I said, it wasn't one day. It was a gradual, a, grad, a very gradual thing that's still going on to this day. Um, but I think it, it just came down to uh, continuing to, to do things and be disciplined, um, whether it was going to church or reading my Bible or making a conscious effort to pray for other people, you know, and not praying for myself all the time. Um, those little things, I think, over the years have added up and really um, kind of transformed not only my mind, but kind of what I 
uh, what I consider myself and put my hope in um, instead. So. And I think adding on to that, I, I think before 2012, I, I've, my identity was defined by how people defined me. Um, and so whatever the newspaper wrote about me, that's who I was, or whatever a person said about me, that's who I was that day. And then the next week, whatever a, a, a news station said something about me, that's who I was that week. The next day, whoever my family member said I was, that's who I was. And that's a roller coaster of emotions because at the end of the day, people are gonna say different things about you every single day. You're gonna have your number one fan saying you're the greatest of all time. You'll have an Ohio State fan saying you need to be cut from the team, you know, so you're just going and you're living up and down on this roller coaster. And when 2012 came, my life started being defined. My identity started being defined by who God said I was. Nobody else mattered at that point. No, what nobody else definition of me, uh, that, that, that didn't matter to me anymore. And I'm not going to sit here and say that that happened. That was not something that happened like that because that was something that I had lived 22 years of my life doing. 22 years of my life, my, my identity was, was found in what the world said I was. Um, and so that has been a, a steady progress of, of, of changing my thinking and changing um, and, and learning. You know, there's the only way you can find out who God says you are is by once again getting into his word and, and seeing what he says. So. So you guys, you talk about this, I've heard the expression, there's expressions used in Christian sports circles of an audience of one, you know, playing to an audience of one. Uh, and I, I think some of the things you're saying are, are talking about that, but maybe comment on that a little bit. What does that mean? Because I, I know, you know, growing up in athletics and sports, watching young people, you know, so much of our identity is defined by what other people think of us and how successful we are based on some external standards that others have established. So how do you move from that, <laughs> you know, that way of living to living to life in a sense for an audience of one, really based on what God says about you? What does he say about you, you know, that, that makes you want to live based on what God says about you? So. I wonder if you could just talk about that. How do, you, how do you get out of that rat race of just being driven by that, that external thing out there that people um, have, have placed for us to, to call ourselves significant or successful or not? And how do you move to really living in an identity, a new identity that's found in, in God and his love? Not, not yeah, I think for me, it, it just came with with scriptural meditation. I mean, when I, when I struggle with fear, Second mm -hmm. Timothy, God did not give us a, a spirit of fear. When I struggle with, with feeling inadequate or unable to do something, Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ. When I'm feeling um, low self-esteem, when I'm feeling like I'm, I'm not enough, Romans says I'm more than a conqueror. So it's just, you, you can't just, negative thoughts are gonna come. There's an old joke, you guys might, actually might be familiar with it, but you know, you, you, you can't keep the bird from flying through the barn, but you can, you can control how long it stays in there. Is that how the joke goes or is that wrong? You guys are, in, we're in the country, don't play around. <laughs> sounds good, sounds it. good. That sounded good, my guy. You, you can't I never it. heard that before, but I like really? it. That was so wisdom hey, from. We good. I can't believe it. You guys have heard it, you guys are playing around, but you can't, you can't. It's not, I will say it's not really a joke. It doesn't sound like a joke, it's more like a. It is proverb. A, you, you can't keep, yeah, it's more it's like a proverb. A, you can't kind of keep the bird from flying in the barn, but you can control how long it stays. What's in the punchline, my friend? <laughs> it's good though. We but, could uh, continue. Whatever. Anyway, so the, so the, that metaphor is, is is just used to say you you sometimes can't control the negative thoughts that that come in your mind. Things just pop up. Uh, ideas just just come in there. Negative things just come in there. Um, inadequacies just come in there, memories of, of failures just come in there. You gotta immediately replace those with something. If you don't have something to replace those with and they just stay and they linger and they grow into something else and then the snowball of events just takes you down a rabbit hole of events where 
you wouldn't even have to go down if, if you just change your thinking. So you can only replace those negative thoughts with positive ones by knowing the positive ones in the first place. Aaron, you want to add to that? Yeah, just a little, um, and just kind of more how it's worked in, in my life and in basketball. Uh, the audience of one thing is, it's, it's like one of those, it's almost like a cliche, as you said, in, in, in sports circles that if you hang out with, um, you know, a lot of people say it, and it's, it's super tough to, to live by that. Um, <clears throat> like you said, because there's a lot of pressure on everything you do. And uh, for me, it's like Dallas said, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily, a daily fight, a daily grind. Like today could be great. Tomorrow, it doesn't matter how great yesterday was. Today, I need to wake up and start the fight once again. Um, and for me, uh, <clears throat> this is strictly for basketball, but before every game, um, I, I can say a prayer on the floor. And, and one of the things that I've said over the last, honestly, three, four years is um, it's in Second Samuel, but the guy, he's about to go into a battle and it doesn't look good, looks like he's going to lose. And, and he sits down and prays and says, God, give me the courage to leave the results to you. Um, and that's just what I've, what I've prayed before games now. And um, it just gives me the right mindset. Uh, you know, I, that is, that ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You know, God knows the outcome. He's, he cares. He cares about who wins and who loses, and, and he's in charge of that. You know, we don't, we don't live under a God that, that is incapable of, of dealing with everything else going on in the world and also a sports outcome. Uh, I, th I believe God is big enough to, to handle everything that's going on in our lives. And as Dallas said, everything is, is guided to work for our good. And that includes the outcome of sporting events. So like at the end of the day, you know, give me the courage to, to be okay with what, you're, that what you want, to, want it to be, God. Like don't let me wrestle and fight that. If that's me struggling, going 0 for 10 and us losing, then make me okay with that. Um, and obviously there's some applications for that, you know, in, in real life, you know, make me, give me the courage to be okay with, you know, what job you give me, with where, where I have my home, what, you know, what friends I make. Um, but obviously a lot of this stuff is a lot easier said than done. And um, it is, it's a daily grind. Uh, you know, I think grind is the proper word for, for, that, for that battle that goes on. Um, I guess Dallas a little more specifically, maybe um, what's the the difference when you know you were you knew the Christian faith, you'd grown up in it uh, for quite a while, were involved in church, um, and then you know really uh, ha had a moment where you recognized that you wanted to be all into that and and surrendered to that. Um, what was what were some of the, the differences in in your life, whether it was you know spiritually, mentally, uh, just like you know, how you experienced uh, your, your faith and God or your relationship to God before that and, and after, what changed? Like, did it res any good result? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think what Coach Mo hit on earlier today is perfect. From 1988 to 2011, I knew about God. I knew about Jesus, I had heard about him. I knew, um, I, I knew facts about him. I knew, I knew some facts about, about God and Jesus Christ. From 2012 on, I actually knew Jesus Christ. You see, there's a, there's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. I think you guys in this room know about Aaron Craft, but I, I know Aaron Craft, and there's a difference. There's a complete difference, and so, the first 22 years of my life, I knew about God. I knew about Jesus. I had heard about him. I had been in church my whole life, and so I, I, I knew about him. But from 22 until 30, I can honestly say I know God. And it's, it's, it's totally different. It's, it's a part where knowing about God is just reading the Bible because you feel as if you're forced to do it or going to church because most of the time I was forced to go to church, but you, you're not doing it out of, out of love. There are some married couples, Crafty can even attest to this. I'm sure if he, if he took some flowers home to Amber and just threw them at her and was like, here, take these, like you're my wife, whatever, here, take them. She wouldn't be too receptive of those. She may smack you. <laughs> she wouldn't like that too much. No. Exactly. So that would, that would not go over well in the craft house. But if you, she would throw the baby at me and probably leave. Then, you know, <laughs> hand, rightfully so. Hand the baby. That's right. Rightfully so. 
But if you took those flowers, you were like, hey, Amber, I just want to tell you it's Tuesday. I love you. I appreciate everything you do for you. This is, this is no strings attached. I just, want to, I just want to tell you I love you. That's totally different. And that is sort of how my relationship with God changed. Earlier on, I was doing things out of coercion. I was, I was, I was praying because I felt I was forced to, or I was going to church because I felt I was forced to. I was reading the Bible because I felt as if I was forced to. Now I'm doing it because I want to. And there's a, there's a totally different thing. I, I have no expectations. I have no, that there are no, nothing that I, I expect from God. There's a difference between living for God and allowing God to live through you. You know, when you live for somebody, you expect them to do something in return. When I, when, when if, if I were to do something for Kraft, I, w- I would expect him to, to do something back for me in return. And that's sort of how we approach God in, at times. I'm, I'm doing all this for you, God. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing all this for you, and you're not doing anything for me, and that's not how God operates. Christ wants to live through us. And, and I think that's, that's the total, that's the difference in, in my life. Mm. Yeah. That's good, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really powerful. And it, it seems like really it's a, it's a full shift ultimately of kind of what your reference point is to how you think about yourself and think about life. You know, that we're, we're not just trying to do religion or do the God thing as a part of our life, but see that God's created us and actually, the reality is, he's made us for a relationship with him. That's, what, that's the truth. That's a reality. And, but I, I know for a lot of people, even though hearing that, it kind of causes, strikes this chord in your soul, though, to go, oh, man. <laughs> okay, I'm waking up to the fact to say, you know, there is a God, and he knows me, and he created me for all this, and I've been dissing him. I've been playing games. I didn't, haven't cared, a, you know, at all about him. What do, you, what do you say to people who feel that? Like, how could I ever come to God? Or how could God ever, I ever have a relationship with God? You know, I feel like I've been, you know, doing all this stuff. I feel guilty, weighed down. Just, just not sure what to do with all that. Wow. You want me to go ahead and, it's uh, a great question, Bill. Thanks, sir. Um, you know, I think the first thing I would say is you can't outrun God's grace. Um, and I think if you, if you need examples of those, opening the Bible is the greatest place to, to go for that because some of greatest, uh, the Bible's greatest heroes, like that you would say were heroes, have some pretty messed up pasts and did some pretty messed up things. Um, you know, David killed a guy, um, took his wife. He took his wife first and then killed the guy and then took the wife. Um, he's, a, he's called a, God, uh, a man after God's own heart in the Bible. Um, you know, Moses tried to deny everything he wanted to do. Like, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. God said, no, you can. Like, I, I can do this with you. I can do this through you. Um, all his disciples left Jesus before he went to the cross. And they all ran scared and hot and hid. Peter denied him three times. Um, Paul, the guy that wrote half, almost three-fourths of the New Testament, was, were, was killing Christians one day, and the next day was the biggest advocate for the church. Um, so God doesn't, God doesn't call us to him when, we're, when we've fixed everything in our lives. God hasn't called us to him when we feel like we've done enough good to outweigh the bad, and then he's like, all right, yes, now I can, I can call you my child. He, he calls us exactly how we are. And that's the beauty of, of the gospel, and that's the beauty of Jesus. And God's love is greater than anything we're going through. The only thing he wants for us is just to open our hearts to him. And as Dallas said, just let him in, surrender. And it's not easy. It's not, it's not easy letting go. It's not easy, you know, giving up your autonomy because especially now, like, we're told to follow ourselves, follow your heart, follow your truth. Um, you go against what the, what the world says, but um, there's a lot of broken people in the church, and, and that's exactly how Jesus wanted it. He came to, to save sinners, not those who were righteous. And, and if you think you're righteous, you don't think you need a savior. And, and that's a bad place to be because we, we all need a savior. Um, we first need to come to grips with the fact that we are, all, we are all broken. We all have our faults. I struggle with things that Dallas doesn't necessarily struggle with, but there are things that he struggles with. 
Um, we all have those things. And people around us don't necessarily need to know those things right away, you know. It's okay to open up to God. You know, he, he's not going to turn you away. Um, God's grace is sufficient for anything. And I think that would be the encouragement that I would give and, and hope, you know, that, that someone would, would accept and believe in because it's true. Yeah, and I, I, I also would, would, I mean, even though we're up on this stage, please don't think that we're the model. We, we, are, <laughs> not, we are not the model. No, um, like you just said, we still struggle with things every single day. We are still pressing towards the mark. The mark is Jesus Christ. He, he is the model. He is who we're trying to be like. So we may be on, we may be on the stage, but don't be fooled. Don't, don't feel as if, wow, if, 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 if I'm not on that level or if, or if I'm not doing that, then I'm not good enough for God. No, that's, that's absolutely incorrect. God accepts you just as you are. But if you're thinking that, okay, I'm going to, I'll get myself together next week or I'll get myself together next month. I want to, I want to get myself together before I open up my life and I allow Jesus Christ into my life. And you'll be, you'll be waiting forever because the reality is we can't get ourselves together on our own. We can't do it on our own. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have came and died. We need a savior. And that's, that's just the reality of it. So don't, don't, we're just up here telling our story, telling our struggles, telling what we do now but we're not the model. Jesus Christ is the model, and we're simply trying to point everybody to him. So I'd be curious, uh, you maybe have mentioned it a little bit, but a, a life verse, Dallas, you mentioned kind of a life verse. Do, do both of you have a, a verse you go back to frequently or, or maybe just something recently that you've taken from God's word that's been powerful in a, in a real way and just uh, kind of rubber meets the road situation? Yeah, Do Dallas obviously shared um, one of his. I know he has another that hopefully he shares with you. Um, I, there, there's a couple. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them my, my life verses, but um, two that I frequently go back to. Um, they're both in Romans. Romans 5, 8 says, uh, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Um, that just reminds me who I am, really. You know, I, I can't change who I am. Uh, it reminds me of the, the depth of God's love for us. And on days when I'm really, whether I struggle, I haven't read frequently, I am behind on my Bible reading plan. Um, like days like days like that, you know, God still loves me. He loved me at my worst, my very, very worst. When I would, when he wasn't even a thought in my mind, he still loved me. Um, and the proof of that is that Jesus came and died for me. And the other one is Romans 8.32, which is similar. It says, um, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So, um, you know, I've heard it explained as it's, a, it's an argument that, you know, um, the argument goes, if I asked my, my neighbor to, to let me borrow his car, and he let me borrow his car, um, I'm pretty sure he's gonna let me go over and borrow a cup of sugar, you know, because the car is much more valuable than the cup of sugar. So if he was willing to give me the car, he's gonna give me everything else that's less valuable than the car. So in the Bible verse, you know, God gave up his son who was infinitely valuable to him, um, his love, his fellowship, infinitely valued to God, he gave it up for us. So there's nothing that he's gonna withhold from me that I need or want, or, but that I want, he's going to withhold for sure. Um, but what I need is the right word. Um, he's, there's no reason for him to hold it back. He's already given up what's most valuable to him. So it would be foolish of me to think that he would withhold a cup of sugar after he gave up his, his son to die on the cross because that's just foolish. So that just, you know, that makes every promise in the Bible that we talk about more real. Like there's, there's ground underneath that. It's not an empty promise because... It would be foolish if he gave up his son, but then didn't follow through with the perfect peace that he trusts, that he, you know, promises me. So um, that's kind of how it just gives strength to me in the promises that I have a few memorized and can recite to myself. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Really, I love that image, the car and the sugar. <laughs> it's like, yeah, really, anything, you know, if he if he gave his son, I mean, everything else is going to be less than that. You know, why wouldn't, why wouldn't he follow through on, on those promises? Talk to us briefly. I mentioned I want to come back to it. 
Uh, talk about the role of community and friendships and relationships that spur you on. You know, there's a Bible verse that talks about iron sharpening iron or spurring each other on to love and to good deeds. And uh, how have you guys done that? How, how do you, when you think about people who, especially young people I'm thinking about, who want to follow God, but the biggest challenge they might feel is community. You know, the, the, those around them aren't following God and they really struggle as a result of that. How do you cultivate friendships that where you spur each other on? Uh, I think for me it was an incredible blessing to have um, to have Crafty and Johnny D with me when I was going through that transition in 2011, 2012. Um, because when you're making that transition, you need support. You're going to need friends. When you're trying to change your life from what it used to be to what it should be, uh, you're, you're going to need people to hold you accountable, to help hold you accountable. You're going to need people that, um, that you can confess to, that you can tell your struggles to, that are going through the same thing you're going through. Me and Johnny D made a pact um, when we were in college that, that, that had to do with, with some personal things, and we held each other accountable with that. We, we, he called me and, and told me to call him and make sure he was, he was where he needed to be, and I did the same thing. And to the young people in the crowd, man, please, I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to, to really pay attention to who your friends are because you guys, you guys really impact each other way more than you think, way more than you know. Um, Crafty will never know the impact he has had on my life. Johnny D will never know the impact that he's had on my life, but they've had a humongous impact. Those were the friends that I chose to spend a lot of time with during that time where I was, I knew I, I, knew I needed to change my life. Those were the people that I was spending a lot of time with. So ch please choose your friends wisely. That, that, that community that we're talking about, it, it, it's important because eventually, eventually it, the, the suggestions and the, the ideas of your friends are gonna influence you. We have so much power we don't even know. Like there are, there are people paying attention to us that we don't even know are paying attention. Younger siblings, younger cousins, younger athletes in this room, people are paying attention to us. So how we live our life matters and, and the choices and the decisions we make on a daily basis, that really does matter. Yeah, um, I was, I've been super blessed with people that, um, they stepped out in faith and reached out to me. And that would be the encouragement that I would want to give, you know, the people in the room that maybe have already heard kind of what we're talking about. And like you said, they, they want to live this life, but they aren't sure if they should do it. They aren't sure what their friends will say. I wouldn't be up here if I had a friend in high school that didn't step out. Um, and then I, would st I stepped out and got another one of our best friends to, to come to that same Bible study. And he's helping out with this same uh, the same organization like with us now um, and I, the same thing John and Dallas like just people that were willing to step out and take a chance on me and uh, it changed my life forever and they weren't doing anything super special they didn't do it wasn't a grand presentation with a PowerPoint with great transitions you know it was it was just an honest hey man like I'm going to a Bible study tomorrow do you want to come and it was it was it was simple and it was persistent and I think that is that is a key um, aspect of, of living the Christian life in general but if, if you're going to continue to try to be that person in those pe uh, in the life of those around you you have to be persistent because like I said like not everyone's going to jump at the drop of a hat it would be awesome if they did and um, praise God for those people but um, a lot of people that I've been come in contact with, it, it took multiple interactions. And it's those same people that they're just waiting for that moment for you to, to feel weary and, and give up and slip. And they're going to be the first ones to tell you, like, oh, you say you're a Christian, but you did this the other day. And that's when you stand up and you say, I absolutely did. You know, I messed up for sure, but um, I don't have to be perfect. You know, I, I, I believe in a God that forgives forgives me when I mess up, and, and I, I, I want you to, to believe in that same God too. Um, so being as persistent as possible and, and consistent with, with your walk 
and not being afraid to step out. Like I said, I wouldn't be here today if, if people didn't have the courage that they did to do that. So. Yeah, and I'm sure you wouldn't literally be on the stage talking about this kind of stuff. I wouldn't. I would not. <laughs> I, I would not. You know, God, God might have had different plans somewhere down the road, but uh, I, I would not be. I would not be here. So. Yeah, and it's as you talk about that because I know you're talking about Mason. You know, who's a part of this with us, and he he definitely talks about you know because you step forward, he did too. You know, and he pro but he felt like he wasn't going until you you went, and so I think it's a, that's a big challenge, and yet it, it's so cool to look at it from where you're at now in life, and what that step meant and means ten years later For sure. in your lives, and you know here we are with you know together talking about Momentum Ohio that was forged in these friendships that you and you and Dallas have, John has been a part of that as well, and guys like, like, like Mason. So I would love for you to, if you can say whatever you want. Can I add something real yeah, quick? Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would also say, like, when I look back on my life, the biggest regrets I have are not the times that I stepped out and were rejected. It's the times that I cowered and feared in my heart, like, oh, I can't believe, I don't know what they're going to say, and didn't say anything. Um, I regret those moments way more than any time that God gave me the courage to step up and ask a question. Um, the times that uh, I let my, you know, my, my human side take over and, and tell me that it wasn't worth it or um, to, you know, I'll do it next time or in those times, I, those are the times I regret the most. So that's, I just, it just hit me. Sure. Yeah, that's a great word. And it, so talk, talk for just a couple minutes about Momentum Ohio and what, you know, encouraging faith, inspiring hope, Talk about your heart for this, and what is it that you hope for, long for, desire to see, you know, so, you know, as you, you think about what you're doing, what you're part of, why are you doing this, you know, and what's, what's the hope that you have for the state of Ohio, the impact this could have? Mm. Mm. <laughs> me for a loop, Bill. <laughs> He's never asked us this question before, so... We don't have a pre, uh, pre, -wired pre packaged answer for you, so this well, could be pretty. Let's talk about your heart for for the people of Buckeye yeah, Land. Yeah, no, I I I'm with you. Um, and, I, and we touched on it earlier. I think what our ultimate message we think is of all, the utmost importance. We believe what we're talking about is is the truth. Um, we it's more than us just thinking it and like allowing you to think. You can think, but. We think, we believe what we're talking about is the truth. And we believe it's the truth for, for every single person in this room, uh, in this state, in this country, in this world. And, and that's the main reason that I would say we are up here is because people need to hear this truth. Um, they need to hear about God. They need to hear about, they need to be humbled. They need to hear that we're messed up. Like every single one of us is messed up. And it's okay to be messed up. Um, and that God still loves us. Like people need to hear that. So that's kind of I think that's tip top of of kind of where we're at and why why I want to do this. Um, the other thing was you know we received a ton of support from I assume many of you in this room while we were playing college basketball, and it was a lot of fun. Like, but playing in an empty gym would have been real boring. Um, playing in front of you guys and having your support throughout the four years we were in school and even now um, to be able to come back and, and see you face to face and just come to these communities, these smaller communities and really partner with you guys and, and let you guys know that you know, you're cared about, people think about you, we care about you, we want what's best for you, um, especially you guys that are in middle school, younger, high school for sure. Um, I was in high school, you know, not too long ago. I know the pressures that come with that. And I, I just want to be able to give you guys an option to see, you know, the path that um, we believe is the right one to choose. But there's a different path in the world than what the world sells you. Um, there's a different option that you can choose. And it's not always going to be easy, but we think it's worth it. Um, we, we, and I guarantee you would find that it's worth it if, if you choose it too. So I think that's number two. You know, we want to... We want to care for you guys. We want to give back because you guys gave a lot to us. And uh, number three, um, 
I just like hanging out with these guys, to be honest. Um, like just planning these things and I don't want to be remembered as a basketball player. You know, I don't want um, when I'm done, when I'm 60, 70, um, I'm going to get a lot more joy out of someone coming up and telling Owen that, hey, I met your dad at a Momento, Ohio event and it changed my life or um, it really got me thinking, you know, that's going to be way, way, way more impactful on me than someone said, hey, I used to watch your dad in college and he was okay, you know, like, <laughs> I, that, that's just, just okay. I, I was okay. Um, th that's, you know, that, I, I want to have a bigger impact than being a basketball player. I want, I want to use what I've been given um, and be sure that I'm being faithful for, with what I've been given um, because ultimately God's going to ask me that question when Jesus returns or he calls me home, you know, that's, that's a question I'm going to get. You know, hey, what did you do with what I gave you? And I want to be able to honestly answer that question well and, and say I was, I was faithful with, with what he gave. So that would be Thank you. my three. Ditto. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, th I, th I think he, he says something that's about changing lives. Um, I think that the two pillars that we do have are inspiring hope. What does that mean? Like I said earlier, I think depression, suicide rate, people are walking around in this world without hope. People are just, they're just living day to day, just existing, not really living. We're just existing. There are some people in this world, some people in this room who are simply just existing. The, the inspiration of hope is Jesus Christ. The inspiration of of, of knowing that there is a way out, of knowing, of, of being excited about life, of waking up intentionally, knowing you have a purpose. Um, that is the hope that we want to inspire in people who may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then for those who do, encouraging faith. We, we want to encourage you guys. We want you guys to continue to press forward. We want you guys to keep going and um, to let you know you're not alone. Like, we're, if, if nobody else is with you, we are. We, we, we want to encourage you guys to, to, to not be ashamed of your faith. We want to encourage you guys to, to not back down, to not be afraid to um, go against the grain. To my young audience, don't be afraid to do the opposite of what the world is doing. Don't be afraid to, to, to be different than, than what your friends are doing. Like we talked about a little earlier, when you're different and when you stand for what's right, they may they may make fun of you initially. They may make fun of you. They may look they may look like you're you're weird. But eventually they're going to start respecting you. They're going to be like, wow, there there's something different about this young lady. There's something different about this young man, and I want to know what it is. And so that's going to incite a conversation where then you'll be able to to present the gospel to them. And so I want to. I, that's what we're here for. We're here to inspire hope to to a world that. Um, some people in the world are just simply hopeless and then to encourage the, the, the faith of, of those who are walking this walk. Um, and so in a nutshell, just, just want to continue to change lives. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, tonight is the NBA draft, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yep. So uh, I remember many years ago when I was much younger than I am now, I remember watching the NBA draft in a number one pick is a guy named Len Bias. And uh, anybody else remember that? Len Bias. They're all older people. Unbelievable <laughs> night for that guy. Unbelievable night for that guy. Number one draft out of Maryland. I think he was like 6'8", incredible athlete. He was a killer, for sure. You know, phenomenal future in front of him. He was a killer. Bro. And it really hit the pinnacle of what any young athlete would want. By the weekend after the draft, they were burying Len Bias. He was dead 24 hours after the draft. And I, I remember that. I just remember it making a big impression on me, kind of the contrast of going from what seemed to be the greatest thing possible in life, you know, this culminating moment, to them, his friends putting him in the ground, his family watching him being put in the ground after he walked on the stage in New York a few days earlier. And it's just, it was, it was really hard to even put those two together. But I think, I think it reminds us of the bigger picture. You know, when I think about that, it, for me, it, it challenged me to think of 
the bigger picture of life and the eternal things that are so much weightier, you know, than, than anything else. And so we've, we've had a great chance to get a peek inside of these guys' stories. Really grateful for you guys that you're open and transparent to sit on a stage and talk about your own life the way you are. I know that it's not necessarily the, the thing that you always want to do, but you're choosing to do it because you care about people you care about God, and you, you want others to be inspired and encouraged through your life and your example. And I know these guys are humble enough that they sometimes even struggle to think that, you know, <laughs> you know do, do, does anyone really even care what we have to say? I'm surprised there's this many people here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of the things that I love about both of them is the genuineness of their character and their heart. Um, and Dallas, I wonder if you would kind of put a a little wrap on this. Maybe just got people sitting here thinking, okay, what do I do with this? I want, what if I want a relationship with God? I, I don't think I have it like what you're talking about. What do I do? Where do I start? What, what would you say to him? Well, I would, I would take you to five places in the Bible. Um, and I like to refer to these places as triple R, E, R. The first R is Romans 3.23, which says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we talked about that a little bit. We all have sinned in this room. We all still do sin in this room. Um, in Romans 6, 23, it says there's penalty for that. There are consequences for our sins. There's consequences from, uh, for us being separated from, from God. And that is death. And not just physical death, but it's spiritual death as well. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so the third R is Romans 5, 8. Crafty hit on it, he hit on it earlier. It's, um, God showed his love for us while we were yet sinners, or while we wanted nothing to do with God. We were in total opposition with him. We were in rebellion against him. We fought against him, enemies with him. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And the, the, the fourth verse is Ephesians. 2 verses 8 through 9 it says for for grace you've been saved through faith this is the gift of God it's not by your works there's nothing that we can do to try and earn this salvation there's nothing that we can do to try and earn a relationship with Jesus Christ we can't do it we, we can't read our Bible enough we can't pray enough we can't go to church enough the only way that we can do it is by Romans 10 9 and Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But the, the two things about that is, it says, if you confess with your mouth, now everybody in the room can hear that. You, I did it. I did it. I confessed with my mouth. I said, yeah, I believe Jesus is Lord. Yeah, I believe God raised him from the dead. But I knew in my heart I did not really believe it because it was evident in my lifestyle. I knew in my heart I didn't believe it and God knew in my heart that I didn't believe it. And the same thing goes for you. Like anybody in this room can confess with their mouth, but only you and God know if you genuinely believe that. So triple R, E, R, those, those are, are five verses that can, that can take you through the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and sort of show you what that means. But to, to, there may be some of you in this room that may not even be able to understand that. So I'm, I'll break it down a little more simple. God created Adam and Eve. And he told Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree, any tree in the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He told them not to eat from that tree. Adam and Eve made a decision. They made a decision to eat from that tree. That decision has caused all of humanity to be born out of relationship with God. It, it was their choice. It was their decision to disobey God and eat from that tree. Because of their choice, we are in the state that we are. We, we are sinners by birth. We're, 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 we're born in sin and shaping in iniquity. That's just how we're created. Kraft was talking up earlier. He doesn't have to teach his son how to cry, or he doesn't have to, he's not going to have to teach his son how to say no or how to throw a bottle back. He's not going to teach his son how to be in rebellion against him. It's just natural. I'm sure you guys didn't have to teach your kids to say no. You had to teach them the opposite. You teach them to say yes. You teach them to be respectful. That's just how we're, we are created because of that choice, that decision that Adam and Eve made at the tree. But there's another tree, the cross of Calvary. 
the cross was, 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 was made out of a tree and at this tree we have the opportunity to make a decision. So Adam and Eve made a decision in the Garden of Eden at the tree of knowledge of good and evil to eat from that tree and to disobey God and it shaped the fall of humanity forever. But we have a chance to change our eternal destination. We have a chance to change that choice by making our own decision tonight. Even, even tonight, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until next week. You don't have to wait until next month. You don't have to wait until next year when you feel as if you'll be ready to do it. You can do it right now. You can make a choice at the cross of Calvary and say in your heart, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you went to Calvary. You died for my sins. I believe I'm forgiven. Come into my life. I want to live for you. I want, to, I want you to live through me. I, I am totally surrendered to you. I may have not lived my life the way I should have lived it in previous years, God, and I know you've forgiven me for that. You can do that right now. And if you do that, then God will come into your heart. It's, it's just two decisions at, at, the, at the tree. Adam and Eve made the decision, but you, at this moment, have the opportunity to make another decision. Yeah. Would you uh, maybe take a moment and just lead us in a, in a moment of prayer, Alice, and if people want to make that decision, this could be an opportunity for you right where you're at in your own heart before God to express your desire to, to make that decision to have Jesus in, as your Savior. Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time. God, we don't, we don't take this time for granted. We don't take this, this opportunity for granted. We don't take the fact that even we can assemble in this, in this room right now and be able to come here and freely in this school, in this public school, and talk freely about you. God, we, we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you that you knew this time would happen even before the foundation of the earth. God, you knew that on this date, these four men would be on this stage and these people would be in the crowd. And God, you even knew who right now is going to make a decision to allow you into their life. God, I'm asking right now that you give them the courage to say yes. Simply give them the courage to say yes to you, God. There may be some things that they don't understand. There may be some things that they're struggling with, God. And, and, and that can all be worked out, God. But right now, just allow them to say yes. Allow your Holy Spirit to, to, to fill their heart to fill their mind, God. There are some people in this room who may be struggling. There are some people in this room who may be going through some things, who, who are looking for a way out. God, allow whatever, whatever has been said, anything that has been said up on this stage tonight, God, help them to, to realize that, that total surrender is the best way to live. Total surrender is the best way to live. God, we can't, we, we, we can't come to you holding back some, some part of our sinful life. We can't come to you holding back some part of, 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 of things that we just simply don't want to turn over to you yet. God, we want to give you all of us. So, God, I'm simply asking you, for those who have made a decision for you tonight, God, help the, help the response to, say, to be yes. God, I'm even praying for those who, who are in relationship with you and may have may be struggling and, and, and may be struggling in their relationship with you and may um, be looking for, for, for some type of spark, some type of energetic push. God, help this to be that thing for them. Help this to be that, that encouraging faith to, to encourage them to continue to press on. God, I'm thankful for who you are. I'm, I'm thankful for, for using us. God, I'm thankful for every, every single soul in this room. Whatever has been done tonight, whether a seed has been planted, whether a seed has been watered, God, I'm just asking that you give the increase in whatever capacity you see fit. I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, let's just give a little appreciation to Dallas and Aaron and say thank you for their time tonight. Thank you, guys. Uh, before we close, we're going to pass some, some comment cards. We've got some friends who are out there going to help us out with that. And I just realized that I had the pens. They're in my car. <laughs> uh, here's my 
Wonderful wife, do you want to help out with that? Ladies, if you have some extra pens in your purses and would want to pull those, those out, it, that would be you, awesome. <laughs> you want me to run out there? That's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. I mean. So while they're uh, passing cards out and uh, getting uh, your feedback, if anybody has a question, uh, you're welcome to stand where you are and shout it out to these guys. Fire away. Don't be nervous. Or shy. Oh, appreciate it. Sir? Uh, I expect this to be a little different, but how has your uh, acceptance of Jesus as your Savior affected your relationships with your biological families? Ooh. Wow. Great question. Uh, uh, man, my parents have always been very supportive of everything I've done, and that includes um, going to church when I was the only one in my family getting up and going. Um, that included the, the times I was able to speak at churches when I was in college, and that includes doing events like this right now. Um, that's about as far as it goes. Um, we still have a great relationship. Um, we never, not, not never, but spiritual things rarely come up in my house. Uh, I think the best time that I have for my family is, is golfing with my brother, to be honest, because um, we're alone in a cart together for four hours. So uh, then I, I, I'm a little more intentional there. And my, my younger sister, I believe, is a believer also. So we have that common ground. Uh, with my parents, it, it's one of those things where I need to have that conversation. Um, it's tough, you know, they're, they're parents and, and, and you know, they, they aren't as open to it either, but uh, it hasn't killed our, our relationship by any means, um, but it, it, could, uh, it could continue to improve, so. I, I think for me, there's been, <clears throat> there's been many times where it simply, <clears throat> excuse me, it simply has broke my heart to see um, biological family members struggling when they don't have to but at the same time, I understand that it's not my responsibility to change them. The most that I can do is pray for them and be there for them. I, I, cannot, um, I cannot shun them away. They're my family, and I'm going to love them with, with whatever I can. Um, but at the same time, if, 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 if they are unwilling um, to surrender, if they're unwilling to develop a relationship on their own, I, I really can't do anything about that. You know, it says in the Bible that, that you have to love Jesus more than your family. And so for me, um, I have to follow Jesus even if my family isn't. And there are some people in my family who have been very influential in my life. And we're not as close as we used to be simply because I don't live that way anymore. Does it hurt? Absolutely. Absolutely it hurts. But the most that I can do is is, is pray for them. I've, I've, I've been down the route where I've tried to change them, and that just caused more controversy. It just caused more problems. So, uh, great question. Aaron, with your um, relationship with your, your wife now, um, girlfriend in high school, you weren't a believer or a, uh, had a real relationship with God in high school, but you transformed, and she was a part of that. How has that helped you in your relationship now? Yeah, uh, she definitely evangelized me. Maybe reiterate me. the question so everybody okay. can hear that. No, she uh, she asked me about my relationship with my my wife now, my girlfriend, and when I was in high school, and kind of her her influence on my life because we we definitely dated before um, I was a Christian, and if you talk to her, she would say she grew up in the church, but similar to Dallas, didn't really start taking it seriously until she says around the same time of me. Um, so that, that was cool uh, for, for us to kind of grow together. Um, I was very, I was immature when I was younger. Uh, I have no idea why she stayed with me. Uh, and that's, that is the 100% truth. I gave her multiple reasons to, to break up with me and she stayed with me. Um, and I, right now, I'm very appreciative that she did. Um, but it, it was really cool. Uh, I, I would say early on, we kind of grew, we were growing in our faith separately. Um, because I just liked hanging out with the guys and um, I didn't make her a priority. And the, the moment that I remember having a conversation with 
a guy in college talking about, you know, what, what does this transition look like where, you know, my priorities have always been, you know, God, family, sports, and then my girlfriend. Like, and she knew that when, before we dated, I, I was very explicit in if I have to choose basketball or you, I'm going to go to the basketball gym and shoot. Um, she was cool with that. But obviously, when I start thinking about her being my wife, she goes from number four to being number two. Um, and I didn't know how to handle that. And <clears throat> I've slowly learned and I'm continuing to learn what that looks like. Um, but it's been awesome, I think, from about junior year on, we, we've been a lot more in sync and um, really encouraging one another in, in our faith. And honestly, the best thing that, 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 we've, that we've done is we got married in August and two weeks later, we moved to California and played in the D League. Um, we got away from our family. There, was n there were no other crutches to lean on except for me and her. Uh, and literally that first year we lived in a hotel room. Um, so there was, no, there was no way of getting away from each other. Um, and it was good, it, it, it's been great. Uh, we've really leaned on each other, especially living overseas. Uh, so um, by the grace of God, he kept us together. And um, by his grace, like, we continue to grow to this day. So. Thanks for the question. I think we might have time for one more. One more question. Nice. Nice jersey. Best by dressed the way. in the in the in the stands today. <laughs> he has a number four jersey on. If you can't see. So um, I'm a uh, student at Ohio State, and uh, I find it difficult to balance between school, social life, and faith, and uh, family. Uh, Amen, brother. How did you? Uh, do you have any suggestions or uh, experience on how to balance that? Maybe push uh, faith a little higher up on the mm. scale? Shoot. That's a great question, my friend. Um, obviously, I mean, you can talk. Do you want to talk? I know, bro. He, has jersey. he does have my jersey on. <laughs> <laughs> it's Dwayne Washington, isn't it? Uh, it is Dwayne Washington now. Sorry, man. Also, Daniel Giddens wore it for a year. Yeah, that's right. Um, Dwayne. No, obviously, you know, we have some experience with this. Uh, we, threw in a, we threw in a sport in that, that list of things you're, you're talking about. Um, biggest thing uh, that helped me was, one, uh, just having my priorities in order, um, which meant saying no to things at times that I, a lot of people were saying yes to, but I knew I had to say no to. Um, whether it was, most of the time, those were social things. Um, I didn't, I went to like two parties when I was in college, so like I'm not talking like going out like that, but uh, <clears throat> just even many things like going to someone's house and hanging out, uh, I had to say no to those things a decent amount because I knew I had to get my schoolwork done. Um, what, what really helped me honestly was uh, the friends that I surrounded myself with and the people that I lived with. They were all believers, so that combined multiple of those things that you're talking about. You know, my, my social life and my faith were intertwined every single day um, with those guys. Like, those are my, my, my most fun memories are from those guys, um, living with them for two years, just holding each other accountable, arguing, and um, having biblical theological debates that we knew nothing about, but acting like we did. And, um, you know, Taco Tuesday, which was awesome. Like. Um, just <clears throat> that was a way for us to combine those two and so I didn't have to choose as much that even added you know the social aspect of let's all hang out like we all had the same priorities and values so it wasn't difficult to I didn't have to say no to anything because we all just wanted to hang out um, so yeah I would say those two things you know priorities for sure and you had to be willing to say no um, I stayed in many Friday nights to write papers and and things which I'm a nerd yeah for sure uh, but, you know, it had to be done. So um, find a way to, to do that and then find some good people to, to hang around with and be with. Just align yourself with, with those people. Um, they can be great to, you know, they're still my best friends to this day. So uh, I love those guys. So that's that's kind of what I would say. Don't forget about your family, I guess, but they kind of naturally take a back seat when you go to college. So. I'm not recommending that, but you got dad sitting right there. I yeah, think, I see. So. Uh, he gave me the stink eye when I, <laughs> I saw this. Gave me the stink eye, but you know, he wants you to grow as a person and as an individual. Absolutely. And as you continue to grow, I guarantee you'll like he'll come back. Like you'll you'll come back. Like I, 
I miss, I, I love relationships with my family more now than any other time because I just see the value in it, so. All right, uh, just a couple announcements while we're gathering up those cards because we're gonna draw three of them uh, out to give some Momentum Ohio t-shirts and we'll have Dallas and Aaron sign them. Uh, if you want. If you want, if you not, keep it you could if you want sign to. your own or whatever you wanna do. You could get the black one and it won't show up, so. Uh, we do want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook. We're really just getting rolling, I would say, in many ways with Momentum Ohio. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of encouraging things. But you can find us on our Facebook page, Momentum Ohio, learn about other events. We know that a lot of people, we thank those who shared this event with others and others heard it as a result. So feel free to find us there, MomentumOhio.com as well. Um, I know that Faith Alliance Church has some, a couple things they want to share as opportunities coming up, so I believe they're receiving an invitation right now to something, so. Yeah, so what you're receiving, it just has a little bit of information about who we are, and uh, I think there might be some upcoming events. Dallas is actually going to be preaching at Faith Alliance on July 7th, so if you want some, some follow-up, a chance to hear from him more, uh, he'll be speaking July 7th at the church. Um, and, I, and I guess, again, just our heart behind this was uh, to show a, a community that we care for them and we care for you uh, as individuals, and at the end of the day, you know, it's it's not about um, the name of, of a church. It's about people knowing Christ, and uh, these guys come with no agenda. Um, so, you know, we like to think we have a space where you could get to know Christ and, and seek after him uh, to grow in faith or understanding. Uh, if, if you don't have a place to, to let that play out, uh, we just want you to know you'd be welcome, and it'd be a privilege to journey alongside of you in that process and uh, just invest in you as uh, a person trying to, to learn more about Christ and to know him personally uh, with your family or by yourself. So, um, yeah, check it out. If you have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Pastor Trent. Do we have the cards? Let's bring them on up here. And we're going to draw three. We have three symbolic t-shirts here because we don't know what size you will need. So uh, we'll let you uh, go back to the table where you have uh, all sizes and three different colors to choose from. So, all right, uh, Dallas, you wanna take one out of the stack here? You got two, all right, here. One of them was blank, so. Go ahead. Katie Sprague. Katie Sprague. Who's Katie Sprague? Casey or Katie? Katie, Katie or Casey? Katie. Okay, all right. Sprague. When you're done, come on up and claim this, and you can take it to the table. And nice, Katie. Hey, Katie. All right. What up? All right. I would like to give a quick shout out to the family back there holding this baby. That is <laughs> magical. Wait right a minute. Now. Wait a minute. Don't neglect the young lady. And no, the, this yeah. this is seriously magical Champions. stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> My son's really fallen asleep in our arms like three times in our life, and that's yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. I, man. All right, Aaron. Who we got? Uh, oh no, I almost read the church name. That'd have been embarrassing. Quentin Sprague. Oh my Quentin, goodness. wow. Unbelievable. All right, keep it's it in the family. family. What's up, Quentin? All right. Can I call you Q? Q. All right. Okay, Dallas, last one. Pastor Trent. It can't be your son, that's all I'm saying. Megan Jurassic. Megan. Congrats. Wow, it's like all that section right there. That's amazing. Interesting. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, come see us afterwards. So we're going to, to wrap up here. You're welcome. Dallas and Aaron will be down here for, uh, if you want to come and say hi to them, get a picture with them, have them sign anything. They're happy to do that to accommodate. But we just want to say on behalf of Momentum Ohio and Faith Alliance Church, uh, thank you, New Bremen. Thank you for all of you who've come and chosen to spend the evening with us. God bless you guys. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming. Good night.